Another concept that's going to apply to smooth steady flow is something called Bernoulli's principle and it's relatively straightforward. It says suppose you have a fluid and the speed were to increase then the internal pressure of the fluid is going to decrease and vice versa. So as the speed goes up then the pressure inside of it is going to go down. So it's actually kind of counterintuitive. So let's kind of um, go ahead and combine these two ideas. So you know, here we've got some fluid and it's flowing in this large um, area and it's going to, going to go down through a constriction. So here we're going to have a relatively large area and the speed is going to be relatively small. Right over here the area has gone down and so the speed must have gone up. If you go ahead and you take a look at these bubbles right here, these bubbles are well, relatively small and as they go through the constriction, what Bernoulli's principle says is if the speed goes up, then the pressure inside of them must go down. And so what that means is these bubbles get a little bit larger. So you can kind of see that right over here. So kind of, once again, speed, speed is larger, pressure goes down. So here I have two Coke bottles suspended by strings. Go ahead and make a prediction. Which direction will they move if, if I blow in between them? they moved inwards. I increased the speed, therefore decreasing the pressure, so they moved from high pressure to low pressure. Another example of Bernoulli's principle is a simple vacuum made of ping pong ball, and I set this on there, you might be saying, hey, you know, the air is just pushing up. However, it's actually traveling faster on the top of the ball, and you can see this because I can mess around with the ball simply by putting my hand above it. So it's not being pushed up, but it's also being pulled up or sucked up. And I can even tilt it off the side, just like this, and we can do it again. So Bernoulli's principle, the fact that um, air moving faster has lower pressure, is able to kind of explain this phenomenon right here. Now, some applications of Bernoulli's principle is going to be just a very simple airfoil. If you think about taking some chunks of air right over here, and saying these airs, air, these air, these chunks of air are going to follow these streamlines, you can kind of see that right over here. The streamlines kind of get got packed in close together, and when they get packed in close together, it means that the speed is a little bit faster, and you think about it, it's got to go faster to travel over the wing like that. So speed is going to go up, the pressure therefore must go down. Right over here, the speed is well, relatively small, and so the pressure is going to be relatively high. So right up here, we're going to have a big low, a big low pressure system. Right over here, we're going to have a big high pressure system. And we know that it's going to flow from, pressure is going to go from high to low. So here we're going to have a buoyant force, or not a buoyant force, but we're going to have a force in the direction going from high to low pressure. <coughs> One thing to kind of keep in mind, however, is, is, you know, there's also kind of the air kind of pressing into the, into the wing like this, and that is also giving it some lift. So it's more than just Bernoulli's principle. If you take an airfoil and invert it, then it's actually something called a spoiler. And if you take a look at this race car right here, essentially it's just an airfoil turned upside down. We're going to have air flowing here, we're going to have air flowing here. Slow speed on top means high pressure. Fast speed on the bottom means low pressure. So the net force is going to be in that, in that direction right over here. And this is going to keep the back end of the car from kind of getting all squirrely. Now, keep in mind, this only works for like race cars or things like that. For your car, at the speeds you're traveling at, there's, there's virtually no air back there. And so for your car, it's really just kind of decoration. Now, before I talk about some more examples of Bernoulli's principle, I have a couple demonstrations for you, so I'll let you watch those. Other examples of Bernoulli's principle is going to be wind blowing over the peak of a roof. You think about you have some chunks of air blowing over the roof, then right over here, it's going to be relatively fast. So speed is going to go up, pressure is going to go down. Right over here, the pressure is going to be relatively higher. So we can actually kind of, you know, blow the roof off of the house, if you will, if the wind is strong enough. Another application of Bernoulli's principle, which is actually quite powerful, is going to be the fact that a sailboat can actually sail against the wind. Against the wind, you may say? Ah, but let's think about this. As long as we don't have a flat sail, as long as we have our sails that are kind of curved, as I'm kind of outlining right here, then the wind can kind of go in that direction. And we're going to have the same thing. Here we're going to have the speed relatively large, so the pressure is going to go down. Speed is going to be large, pressure is going to go down over here. So right over here the pressure is going to be up, pressure is going to be up, and so we're going to experience a force 
due to the wind in this direction right over here and we're going to have a big honking keel sticking down into the water and that that keel is going to you know kind of make the boat feel a force in the sideways direction so it's going to be in that direction right there kind of add these two forces together in your mind and you can kind of see that the resultant force is going to be in this direction right there and the boat can actually move forward as long as you're kind of quartering the wind you can't sail directly into the wind for you baseball fans, this also kind of explains a curveball. We have the ball kind of rotating in this direction. We're going to generate some high pressure right up on top. We're going to have some low pressure right on the bottom because of the difference in velocities. And the flight path of this ball is going to be in the downwards direction. Now, we're going to kind of finish off this chapter by saying we've talked about solids, we've talked about liquids, and we've talked about gases. The fourth stage of matter is actually one that we don't, don't talk an whole awful lot about simply because it's going to be not very abundant on Earth, but it's actually going to be the most abundant in the solar system. And this state of matter is actually called a plasma. It's essentially going to be an electrified gas. If we have a gas right over here where we have the positively charged nucleus and we have some electrons kind of whizzing around that, if we were to kind of free these electrons from the nuclei, so we're going to say, okay, well, you know, if we were to add some more energy and we break these electrons away from the positively charged nuclei, then they're kind of free to roam around. So this guy right over here is no longer bound to that nucleus. The same with that guy over there and this guy over here, they're no longer bound together. What this means is these electrons can, you know, kind of wander around and do what they want to be. So essentially, a plasma is going to be an electrified gas. Um, again, most common thing in the solar system, le least common here on Earth. Um, examples of plasma would be stars or you know something like the sun. Um, here on Earth, we do see it in the form of lightning. So that's, uh, an ex that's, that's an example of a plasma. Or and some of those neon signs or some of the um, you know, some of the fluorescent lights that are in the room here. Other examples of it are going to be the Aurora Borealis, or the Northern Lights, or here we have the Southern Lights, and these are essentially glowing plasmas in the upper atmosphere, where the sun kind of spits a highly, um, highly energetic um, wave at us, and it interacts with our atmosphere, and it's going to essentially glow, so very cool um, colors of, of greens and reds, and sometimes even blues. Um, other examples, ball lightning, and as I said, the sun and the stars. Um, if there is a magnetic field, then it's actually going to produce electrical power. So examples that are maybe more common to us is going to be fluorescent lamps and neon signs. So if we have a tube just like this, and we go ahead and we fill it with a certain gas, and we go ahead and we put some high voltage across this gas, and that's going to cause the electrons to flow, and that's going to ionize or energize some atoms, and it's going to form a plasma. Keep in mind that a plasma is an electrified gas where it's got free electrons. They can conduct electricity. So we've generated now a plasma inside of our tube, so it's going to conduct electricity. The current's going to kind of you know, keep flowing right over here, and it's going to essentially just be putting off some light, and the type of gas that you put inside is going to dictate kind of the color of the light, if you will. So that's kind of how we can have different color neon signs. Now I'm going to kind of finish off this lecture by showing you how you can how you can create a microwave or how you can create a plasma in an oven. Keep in mind that this is ball lightning, so do not, do not, do not try this at home. So here's what you need to set up a plasma in a microwave. You need an old microwave you don't care about. Put some water in the back. Never want to run a microwave with no nothing in it. You need something to catch on fire. Here I just have some toothpicks stuck into a tea candle and you want to contain the plasma so we're going to kind of set up something to contain it you don't want to set it up on the top of the microwave a little test fit of my container now we're going to go ahead and strike a match and set this uh, catch that on fire now that it's on fire we're going to contain it so I'll go ahead and put that guy on there go ahead and shut the microwave and turn it on I have it set for 60 seconds so go ahead and hit start and immediately you see the plasma is going to get, there we go, right, right there on the top of the beaker. That sparkling on the bottom is just my metal, but the stuff on top is plasma. 
I will reiterate, do not set, try to set that up in your parents' microwave. Um, you can go to YouTube. There's a lot of people that um, let it run for too long, and they end up, um, yeah, just go ahead and watch them.